On this week's Culture Report, we're discussing the conflict between Israel and the Palestinian militant group Hamas. Now, the group launched an attack on Israel on October 7th. Israel retaliated. As of today, over 2,000 people have died across Israel and Gaza, many of whom are innocent civilians. We now know Americans are among hostages taken by Hamas. White House national security officials say 20 Americans are unaccounted for after this weekend's attack, and at least 14 Americans have been killed. So there are a lot of moving parts with this. So today we have two guest hosts, our guest host, executive producer of Race and Culture, Victoria Valenzuela, thank you for joining, you. and Profe Professor Micheline Ishai. She's the director of Denver University Center of Middle East Studies. So I really appreci appreciate you for being here. My pleasure. So just to help us understand a little bit more, can we take a step back and just let us know, like, give us a brief overview of how all this started. Well, it, uh, let's not go too far back uh, first. Uh, so there was, uh, as we know, Israel is in confrontations with um, Hamas, uh, which uh, is the predominant group in the Gaza Strip. Uh, but prior to that confrontation, prior to that conflict, that area was really brewing with um, conflict and crisis. So on the Israeli side, we know, for instance, that as of November 2022, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was elected president, prime ministers of Israel and form a coalition, a governmental coalition with a far right party. Mm -hmm. This sparked waves of protest in Israel that created a real crisis in the country and weakened also the country because the government wanted the overall of the ju judicial process, wanted to shrink the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and wanted also to pass legislations that were uh, perceived illiberal for Israeli citizens. So for 11 months, 12 months, we see week after week demonstrations that were never seen before. Okay. That's on the one side. In the government, that specific government, there was an effort also to pass legislations for the annexations of the West Bank. That, of course, provoked Palestinians, over 2 million in the West Bank, and then we see a rise of conflict during that period of time in the West Bank. On the other side, the Hamas in the, in the Gaza Strip, there was an enduring economic crisis uh, that were never taken really into consideration. They were never successfully taken into consideration by the international community, despite effort of the Qatari and others, never really saw millions of people leaving, sort of under blockade, uh, blockade by on the side of the Israeli and the Egyptian. So now we're seeing the crisis is sort of moving in a direction that can uh, slowly explain what happened. On the north side of, the, the, of Israel, we have another group called Hezbollah, which is uh, very much supportive of the Hamas group in Gaza Strip, but it's also supported by Iran. That has allegedly, from now we understand that both the Iranian and Hezbollah have, might have been helping in devising a very sophisticated attack against Israel on October 6 or 7, depending on where we see it, which by, interestingly enough, coincide with um, the commemorations of the 50th anniversary of the October War of 1973, when Israeli were also surprised by an attack by uh, Arab countries, two Arab countries, Syria and Egypt. So that's sort of the setup of why we, we see what we see. Uh, so uh, in, since this weekend, we know that there have been perhaps over 1,200 mm -hmm. people who died in a way that was unprecedented in the country, maimed, uh, killed uh, and indiscriminately. Uh, young people going to party for peace activism mm -hmm. were killed mm -hmm. over 200. Hostages, about 100, 20, 30, we don't know exactly the numbers, were taken in, in the Gaza Strip. And right now we also see a retaliation, retaliations ongoing uh, from Israel back to Gaza with one and one goal is to, is to uh, neutralize as much as possible from the Israeli side um, the Hamas military wing. Speaking of Hamas, I know there's uh, a lot of uh, 
people posting stuff, a lot of people giving context to what's happening. Can you clarify like that Hamas is not Palestine? It doesn't represent Palestine or just so people can make sure that they separate the two. I think a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Yes. Uh, if you were asking Palestinian a week ago what they thought of Hamas, and I'm talking even the one of the, in the Gaza Strip, you probably will have a lot of dissent and distrust about that government, mm. which is, after all, a very theocratic government, um, did not uh, undertake, there was no election since 2006. During the time in 2006, there was a fratricide war between one faction of the Palestinians, which is the PLO and Hamas. So in many ways, you can say it's not the most legitimate government representing the Palestinians. It's, it's, it's very belligerent. It believes in, in national liberations by means of violence. It has its in charter of 1987, the, the, the annihilations of the state of Israel. And it's a revised charter of 2017. It also asks for, uh, it, it does not wish to recognize the state of Israel. So a difficult partner for peace processes as a result of them. Most Palestinians, to go back to your questions, are really individuals who, <laughs> who would do anything to have a more boring life and mm -hmm. a normal life. And they are not able to have that luxury of the boring life. They, I've just spoke recently to uh, a Palestinian student of mine whose parents live in the Gaza Strip and, and told, told me, we are gonna just get collective punishments and we are not really a great support of Hamas. So, so you are correct, there is a dissent, but now that Israel is gonna shelling and is gonna go in, mm -hmm. in, in Gaza, you're gonna have a unity, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of among Palestinians because of that. So is this, can we look at this as Israel fighting Palestine or are we looking at Israel fighting this specific group Hamas? Um, depends of which part of the Israeli government you're referring to. The current government has become like a national unity government in light of the attack of this weekend. In that government, and I think the military apparatus there is more of an effort to neutralize, once for all, the military wing of Hamas, not so much the political wing, but the military wing of Hamas, mm -hmm. and hopefully to get someone else to come to, to replace uh, that representation. So um, the, the Israeli do not and have never negotiated with, with Hamas. They have negotiations, as you know, with the PLO in the West Bank, which have renounced violence and has undertaken some peace processes, peace processes that have not succeeded. And we can talk about that, but the, we have to understand there are two factions among the representative of the Palestinians, now unified in light of the war, but generally not recognized by Israel when we talk about Hamas. So how are Israeli Palestinian citizens, are they being expected to respond to this? Is there a draft of any sort? Are they being pulled in or are they solely victims of these attacks as they're trying to live their lives. So on, on the Israeli side, it has been an extraordinary mobilization process after this weekend. Over 300,000 reservists were called, same reservists who were protesting against the government and, and mentioned that they would never, never come if they were asked to. But under the circumstance, they did, and in fact, 100% came. So a big de deployment of uh, reservists in the north of the country because of Hezbollah mm -hmm. and in the south with the Gazan border. So the response has been strong and the change of tone, of political tone among protesters that were about to sort of cripple completely the government. Now there is a moment of unity. At the same time, most of the protesters want that government to resign at the end of the war. In fact, it's not surprised to see in a lot of those Facebook uh, tags, so resign. You see it, the word resign in Hebrew. So on the one hand, d d distrust of the, the previous government of Go Bibi Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu with his far right wing coalitions, but, but also the fear, uh, an effort to unify, to, to, to confront the attack of last weekend. 
There are so many layers to this, a lot of mm -hmm. politics involved clearly, and the attacks may be isolated to Israel and Palestine right now, but this has real global political implications. Uh, we know the U.S. is an ally of Israel, so can you tell us how and why the U.S. aligned with Israel historically? Uh, <laughs> In 1948, it was not aligned with Israel, although the United Nations partition was clear that there should be an Israeli state and the Palestinians said. Over time, it became more of a, an ally, uh, um, regional powers with Israel. And certainly Camp David was one of the moments in which the, the United States attempted to strike a first peace deal, which was successful between Egypt and, and, and Israel. Then later on, between um, Jordan and Israel, and then more recently, the Abraham Accord, three rounds of it. For, for those who listen to us, the Abraham Accords is a peace negotiations that go in three, three parts. The first was in 2020 between Israeli and uh, Morocco and Bahrain. The second round was between Israeli and, uh, sorry, I, say, I said the incorrect thing. The first round was between Israeli, um, the UAE, and Bahrain. The second round was between Israel, Morocco, and Sudan. And the current one, which has global, uh, and I'll get back to it, ramifications is between Israel and Saudi Arabia. The negotiation has not yet been materialized, but it was happening. And it's not surprised that it coincides with, with the war in, um, in Israel and, and the Gaza Strip. Because all those, uh, uh, peace processes, particularly the recent one, pushed aside the Palestinian question. And that created a lot of anger among the Palestinians for not being taken into consideration during those peace processes. So right now with the US like aligning themselves with Israel right now, does like what do we stand to benefit from that? Like I it's nice to think like, oh they just did it out of the kindness of their hearts, but you know, there's usually something you can get from it. Okay, so the, the United States just recently have said that Biden, mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Biden, our, uh, the president, has mentioned that he was going to send an aircraft uh, mm -hmm. per year in the east of the Mediterranean for two reasons, I think. The first reason is to rescue the Americans mm -hmm. who have been hostage. Mm -hmm. But the, the other reason, I believe, it's, it's to prevent a further involvement of Iran okay. in the conflict. So, as you know, the United States is very much interested in making sure that the Iranians are sort of pushed on the side when it comes to Iranian enrichment and, and, want, and want to make sure also that there will be no nuclearizations of the region. And so this, the Iranians were not very happy about the third round of the Abraham Accord, which would have provided some security provisions to the Saudi Arabia. So, to discuss about the reasons, at least the national, the, the mm -hmm. geopolitical reasons of the United States is to make sure it, that Israel, which is perceived in a life for a very long historical time, is, will actually be able to push aside the, any Iranian uh, involvement and Hezbollah involvement and also maintain the peace processes that has been undergoing in the past. And, uh, like, Iran has been involved, like, well, at least with Hamas, like we know that they have been funding them essentially. Like, what did they get from that? Like, the, the Iranian? Yes. What do they get from that? Well, they want uh, the Iranians are become the kingmakers in the regions with the retrenchment of the United States since the since the Arab Spring. Right. The, the kingmakers that we have today is in the Middle East is is the Iran, is Russia, which is not a friend of the United States these days because of the Ukrainian war, as you know, China, and the United States have lost its influence. Uh, in the region whatsoever. It's attempting to make sure that it prevents the Iranian influence, but it's not doing too much. So the Middle East has push, been pushed on the sideline. The United States have lost a lot of influence in the world. It, it liked to represent itself as the champion of liberal democratic values, but many countries in the world, and particularly in the Middle East, and certainly after the Arab Spring, believe that that's no longer the case. <laughs> Do you think more countries will join in with Iran? Like, I don't know, right now we know Iran was helping Hamas. I, I don't know necessarily for the attack, but I know funding in some, in some ways. But like Russia, for example, especially because they're obviously, like you said, they're not happy with us because, you know, we're helping Ukraine. Um, how do you see other key players, um, political key players, like playing a part here? 
I think that both from the perspective of the United States, even the Gulf countries which were involved in the normalization process of Israel, there is a strong, and, and Egypt as well, there is really a strong call for the escalation because it, it's precisely for the reason that you mentioned, nobody wants to see the, the war spiraling in a regional war. And that will, and it's, the pressure is already ongoing. The Egyptians are on board, the Gulf countries are on board, the Americans are, so I imagine, you know, although nobody has briefed me, that behind the closed door, there is really a lot of pressure ongoing for the de-escalation, precisely for the fear of a regional war. The United States cannot afford it, the Russian cannot afford it, they've been involved in the war in Ukraine, it, it's a no one interest uh, on, the, on the regional level. It will destabilize also the region if that was the case. Well, there's no telling when this war will definitely end. And you from Washington, or the Washington Post, and I quote, Hamas does not recognize the existence of Israel and is committed to replacing it through armed struggle with a Palestinian state from stretching or stretching it from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. In light of this, is it possible for Israel to negotiate with Hamas? Mm -hmm. uh, the Israeli will tell you no. <laughs> they will tell you no because, because of the charter. That, uh, and they never negotiated, in fact, in the past with any Israeli entity uh, simply because they don't recognize the state of Israel. It's, it's the state, as you said, that has to go from, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. So um, what do they want? It's very, so they would want the annihilation of the state of Israel. What they can have is something different. What do the Israeli want is certainly the neutralization of the Hamas wing. Would they get that? It's a different question as well. I think that uh, certainly at the on the short run, what will happen, it's probably thanks to third party, some form of exchange between hostage and Palestinian prisoners. We have about thousands of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons. And, and that particular hostage, that effort to take those hostages to Gaza Strip was done only, only for one reason, for those exchange. So I think that the, at, at the lowest level, at the minimal level, that what will be obtained. Um, very difficult to believe that the Hama, Hamas has the capacity to just undertake this bigger mission that was stated on the, the, the charter. Mm -hmm. uh, unclear whether even the Israeli, with its might, is, will, will be successful. Those are military questions. Whether they'll be able to enter Gaza and make sure that they, are, uh, that they are succeeded in the, in the militarizes the, the military of Hamas. They, they probably think, and I'm here speculating, that the political wing could stay in place, but they would probably prefer a different, um, a different form of representation. So this divide here then leads to Israel essentially blockading Gaza, um, which is going to create a humanitarian crisis inside Gaza. This seems like an impossible situation to solve, but do you have an answer that you could think off the top of your head? Is there a solution here? Well, the blockade is going on two sides. Mm -hmm. The Israeli side, the Egyptian side. Mm -hmm. The many, I, I, from my reading and from my understanding and interviewing other people, it is clear to me that the Israeli wanted to make it more of the Egyptian issue. Mm -hmm. It is going to be an Egyptian issue. The blockade goes one way. If there is a, a humanitarian corridor uh, as a result of the evacuation, of some of the evacuations of some of the cities where it, that are uh, densely populated, that will have to come in negotiation with Egypt because Israel, I don't think, would be ready. To, to do anything at this point in time. They will just close the borders. There is collective punishment, and, and that is very hard to the Palestinian people. But hopefully, third party, Egypt, the Egyptians do not wish to receive Hamas. They have a long history of not getting along with the Muslim brothers and Hamas as well. But hopefully, because they are also neighbors and they have not been directly involved in the confrontations in the specific war, they can provide a third party opportunity to enable people to come their ways and, and it created humanitarian help and assistance. Because as of right now, they can't get out of there, right? Because of the blockades as well with Egypt, a lot of the people yes. that are sitting there, correct? That's right. 
So there's a lot of innocent people that That's right. need to get that aid. That's right. right. And as the war continues, like, like we said, we don't know how long it'll last. Like, how do you see it evolving? And like, how, like, what impact could that have, like, where they are and globally too? It's, it's a very difficult question. At, yeah. at, at, at the midst of a war to think about Usually what happened historically, which is a mistake, but happened always historically, it's a, it's a period of truce arrive, mm -hmm. third party involved, and the Israeli think, okay, we don't, from their perspective, there is no representative that recognized the existence of the state of Israel, so they are, they are doing what you call, they call management crisis, they're not doing peace processes, in which each time that there, there are rockets coming from Gaza to, to Israel, what they w would do in the past, which simply just go back, inflict some disproportional punishments, and then go back and just leave. I mean, there is no occupation. People call it the word of occupation. It's blockade, right? Because there are no IDF or uh, Israeli army before the war in Gaza per se. So back to your questions, mm -hmm. if you bring me back to it. <laughs> no, just ask what the long-term impacts might like. The long-term impact. Yeah, the long-term impact is difficult to say. I think ideally is that uh, there will be soul-searching as to why since 2006, when rockets were sent from Gaza to Israel, and then thereafter every year or two years that happened, that, that, that does no longer work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for the Palestinian people. It doesn't work for Hamas itself. It doesn't work for the Israeli people. and doesn't work for the government. So some form of more pressing solutions with the international community will, be, will, will have to deserve our attention and, and doing something better than the Oslo Agreement or, or, in the, or, Camp, or peace, the Camp David uh, mm. II Agreement. Uh, but that's, that's a wish. It's, it's unclear whether we are at that stage in time to do that. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are innocent Palestinians like caught in the crossfire right now. So, and many Jewish people are feeling alienated right now because they feel that support has been lackluster. So how can Americans best respond to the people who need their support right now? I think that the, the pressuring of humanitarian corridor is the most important because we're in a wartime. So talking about a peace process is sort of like two step ahead and nobody will listen. And there is high level of mobilizations, a lot of anger as you can imagine during the wartime. So I think that pushing the humanitarian corridors, pressuring for de-escalation, making sure that there's hostages exchanges, and then uh, taking the step. I mean, the war will be a much longer war. It might not have to happen on the ground. It might happen on the Israeli side in target killing, which is something that they've done historically when they're trying to hit uh, leaders of Hamas and the military wing of Hamas. So it's unclear how that, what evolved, but I think from people who are sort of within the community in the United States, uh, or sort of uh, people who are caring about innocence, the death of innocence, uh, going in, in these directions, pressuring politicians to push for the, 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 those corridors, uh, for de-escalations, for um, help for innocent people. Um, that's the best they can do. They cannot be in the, in the seat of politicians. They cannot be in s s war rooms and make decisions. So I think that that's the best venue. Yeah, when you speak of the humanitarian corridor, like I was reading yesterday, people are losing power or fuel and, and food, um, a lot of these things that they need to survive. So I think it's, it's important for us to, to remember that there are a lot of people stuck there. I keep going back to that because I know on both sides there's a lot of people that are stuck in there. But like you said, just pushing for that is something that hopefully the government does do. Yes, I, I think the reality, not what we wish, the reality would be that the, the Egyptian will have to, to negotiate it uh, and you know, just allow trucks of food to come in. And it will have to go from this, this side, not the Israeli side. The reality prescribed that, not... So what we wish might not happen because there is now a retaliatory uh, response and another humanitarian response. I think that the negotiations with the, the Egyptian makes more sense, practically. Awesome. So complicated. I know this is so complicated. This is very <laughs> enlightening. You. Dr. Yeah. Isha, I really appreciate you being on the Culture Report today. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. 
At the moment, we don't know how long this war will last, and some organizations that promote peace in Israel and Palestine are working to help the victims. On the screen, you can find a list of the organizations and the links to donate for anyone looking to help, starting with the ALMEP or the Alliance for the Middle East Peace, Doctors Without Borders, the United Nations, and the International Red Cross, which provides assistance during times of crisis. Thank you so much for joining this week's Culture Report. We'll be back to continue the conversation next Thursday right here on 9 News Plus and 9news.com.